Hi, this is Dr. Michelle, and thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 3 through 9. And to begin with, let me tell you a little bit about tradition. The tradition of the elders was a series of rules meant to bolster the ceremonial law of the Jews. Its authority was not supported by the scripture. So when we're reading this scripture, understand that the Pharisees are approaching Jesus and talking from their stance of tradition. Beginning in verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, meaning Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. And that's what I want to talk about, tradition. Do we listen to the word or just follow the traditions of man? The definition of tradition is the handing down of statements, beliefs, legends, customs, and information from generation to generation, either by word of mouth or by practice. In Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, it says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentile shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? We need to understand that tradition and the agreement with the word are not always the same. And a lie believed to be truth is still a lie, no matter how sincere or innocent its intent. So Jesus, when he began responding to the Pharisees, he didn't just answer their question. He, directly that is, he instead he addressed two very significant things. The first thing he addressed is the superiority of God's law over man-made traditions. And that's something that we need to understand today, that we want to hold the word of God above our traditions. And when they don't match, it's not the word you throw away, it's the tradition. And number two, he addressed the difference between ceremonial and true moral definement. What makes you clean? What makes you holy? We might sum it up to if you dress a certain way, if you wear a three-piece suit to church, then you're holy. But having nothing to do with what's inside, that would be something that we could understand. So Jesus enters into this argument by calling the Pharisees hypocrites. That's his first sentence. He doesn't mince words. He's directly in your face. And he says exactly what it is. The term hypocrite referred to actors who wore masks on a stage and they played different roles. Thus, the Pharisees were not genuinely religious. They were playing a part for all to see. When we talk about hypocrites, we need to understand it's not somebody who falls down. It's somebody who teaches one thing and does another. Now, let's look at some things that we have learned that are tradition. For example, the animals in Noah's Ark. If I ask you how many of each species were there, you're gonna probably tell me two of each, right? A male and a female. If you said two, you're not alone in your error as almost every child has been taught this same number. So how many of each species did Noah actually take into the ark? In Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, it says, The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, 
and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. So we need to understand there are things that we are taught that are not in agreement with the word. We need to know this word. We need to look and measure things that are taught. We are taught to discern. God commands us to discern teachers, prophecies, and companions. So when we are taught this, we need to understand it requires us to measure things. When Jesus confronted the Pharisees, they were not willing to be taught or corrected. They just got angry. The word repentance is the word metanoia. And it means change your mind. So we need to be willing to change our mind and not just follow our traditions and our experiences. Because too often our truth is preached to us by our life experiences. When I was studying and writing my doctorate, I remember God showing me some doctrinal things that I learned wrong. And I said, but God, this is what I was taught. And he basically said to me, well, who are you going to listen to me? To who are you going to listen to, me or the teacher? And I said, oh God, at any time in my life, from that day forward, I prayed, change my mind about absolutely anything. You know, there are a lot of things we do in Christianity that aren't necessarily wrong, but we think that they're out of the Bible, and we need to know the truth. For example, it was not until Constantine in the 3rd century with his succeeding Roman emperors that made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire that the Christians then began to build temples. And in some instances, the Christians even took over pagan temples and Christianized them into churches. Church buildings were not in existence before that. The early church in the New Testament met in homes. They went from home to home sharing and breaking bread. When the group got too big, they expanded the home or moved into another home. So it doesn't mean it's wrong to be in a church building. However, it can result in multiple problems. First, people begin to think the church is a sacred space. This results in a separation between what goes on inside the church and what takes place outside of the church. As a counselor, I know a lot about people's lives. I've spoken to over 10,000 people, and a lot of the things that Christians may do inside the building or in roles of leadership, they're not walking out in daily life. This is in, in agreement with the word. We want to walk in agreement. So if blatant evil and immorality was tolerated outside of the church, as long as behavior was tolerated inside as holy, that isn't okay. And the second thing that happened from that whole belief system was that people lost the idea of God being everywhere, omnipresent. The biblical fact that fellowship with God can be anywhere. I can pray on my knees. I can pray standing up. I can pray in the grocery store or when I'm driving. And some people replace it with an idea that I need to be in the church building or at an altar to be able to connect with God. The third thing that some people developed a belief in is that we lost sight of the fact that believers in Christ are the church. This is really important because the Greek word for church is ekklesia, and it does not mean a building. Ekklesia is our body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the church building. So since we need to understand that a lot of this was taught to us through tradition, and there's problems with that. I hear people say things like, um, act right when you're in church, saying to their children, for example, how about act right because you're the church? Or not behave holy because you're in God's place, be pious and quiet and reverent, but be holy because you are the church, not are sitting in it. So we need to understand this. And even though the Bible does not instruct Christians to build church buildings, that doesn't mean a church building is wrong. The fact that the Bible does not command something does not mean the Bible is opposed to that. The Bible neither encourages nor discourages the idea of Christians meeting in buildings that are specifically designed for worship. 
The church building in which the biblical truth is being taught is not unbiblical. The building is not what's unbiblical. It's beliefs that are followed because of tradition that are often attached to the building that makes it unbiblical. So we need to understand we are the church. We are what needs to be holy and act holy. In many churches today, another example is that there's a set in stone structure. So Jesus here was talking about tradition. Well, we follow tradition too. We walk in a church, we greet each other, we sing music and worship, uh, we uh, have an altar call, we have the offering, um, and then we listen to a sermon. This is a set in stone structure for many churches. We want to let the Holy Spirit be in control. The idea of church meeting in such a rigid structure is not presented in the New Testament. When a church has a rigid structure, it can stifle rather than promote true worship. The idea that Christians can unenthusiastically sing a few songs, lassadaisically shake hands and greet people, and inattentively uh, doodle while they're listening to a sermon and reluctantly give an offering and then feel like they're fulfilling their role in the church is completely unbiblical. And you know, this is what Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about, that they were doing and walking through roles and tradition, but their heart was far from God. That is not a position that we want to be in. The church is intended to be a place of healthy fellowship, active participation, and mutual identification. In Corinthians chapter 12, it likens the church to the human body, that all the parts should be functioning together. And in some churches, only the leaders are the ones functioning. And this is not how God intended it. It is tradition in some places. There is undeniably a place for a godly, holy man to be teaching in a service. However, when you read the New Testament, you see it was interactive. When Peter and Paul spoke, people asked questions. They talked back and forth. It wasn't just one person teaching and everyone else passively listening to the sermon. In 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul encourages Timothy to entrust teaching to others who are gifted by the Holy Spirit for teaching. The church is meant to equip us for works of service because we are all called priests in the order of Melchizedek, the Bible says. You are a priest. You don't go to a building to be church. You are the church. You are a priest to serve for God. So we want to give opportunity for people to grow in their, in their callings and not just be pew warmers. The key to avoiding a pagan form of Christianity is comparing every belief and practice with the scripture and removing anything that contradicts what the Bible prescribes for church. So what's the point? As Jesus said, God's word is about the truth and we want to measure everything in relation to it. So when we look at our oral traditions, the traditions we're taught in our churches of what we think normal looks like, of what worship should look like, of what teaching should look like, of what our life should look like, our family, through all of our experiences, we need to measure everything to the word. We are not made into his image, holiness, or saved through tradition, but through aligning ourselves in agreement with the word of God. And I encourage you today to get in this word and know his truth. Thank you for joining me. This is Dr. Michelle. Please like and share.